Welcome back, everyone, for the Design at Large seminar. Uh, come on in and grab a seat. Uh, I wanted to start off by announcing that thanks to uh, Doug Ramsey and Scott Blair, we now have a really nice website for the seminar. So if you missed any of the earlier lectures, you can find the videos online at d.ucsd.edu. In this seminar, we're exploring issues of design that is at scale, embedded in the world, and occasionally subversive. And uh, nothing fits the bill for that, like the recent advances in online education. And when I was putting together a, a list of seminar speakers, um, I was really excited to reach out to Jane Manning and invite her. Uh, Jane is the director of platforms at Stanford, and she's been heavily involved with Open edX. Uh, she has a PhD in philosophy from Stanford, and the topic of her dissertation was pragmatic intrusion. I can't believe you looked that up. And, uh, <laughs> I, I think that her, her current work also fits the bill for uh, that topic. Um, and Jane is someone who has been deeply involved with the recent advances in online education um, from the beginning, at least to the extent that two and a half years ago is from the beginning. And, um, what she has in particular been working on is helping to build up the platforms and production capacity of uh, these online classes. And that interest morphed from um, helping ramp up classes and get them running and have them work well, which are all extremely difficult and important. Uh, and she, recently she's been exploring uh, doing data mining and other analysis techniques to try and understand what are the opportunities, and thinking through what are ways that we can improve the delivery of these online classes, for example, using interactive chat or other ways that take advantage of computers as a medium. And so um, given how much of a whirlwind online education is right now, uh, I'm really grateful to Jane that she was able to take time to come down and join us today. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. Appreciate that. So I'm going to go over some of the things that I've learned about MOOCs in the last two years at Stanford. So here's a preview of the punchlines that you're going to go home with. Um, there's a tension between professionalism, intimacy, and ease of iteration in course production. Using proprietary platforms run, run by for-profits has benefits. They have really good stuff. But there are risks, too, that you should know about. Social features on these platforms are important, but when I took a look at the usage of them, I found they weren't as widely used as I expected, um, and I think they could be improved. So here's what I'm going to talk about today to put some meat around these bones. Um, so I'm going to start with just a little bit about the angle that I approach this from. So this is a picture. Scott, you might recognize that picture. It's the cheap consumer-grade camcorder that I bought when my now 12-year-old was born. I bought it to take home movies with. And at the time, everyone at Stanford who was doing MOOCs were using webcams, and Scott thought that he wanted to be one step up. So I somehow dug up this camcorder, and we used it because it had a firewire connection so that the computer could treat it as though it were a webcam. Um, so I spent a long time crawl being a Jane of all trades, crawling around under people's desks to hook up their webcams, teaching them how to use tablets. Um, I've worked a lot on figuring out what kind of analytics MOOC instructors need. Um, I've done a lot of work trying to gather best practices. So some of the best practices in this area have turned out to be sort of technology specific to what people are using. It. For instance, I often give people the advice that if they're recording a MOOC and they're going to want their handwriting sped up later in post-production, they shouldn't try to talk and write at the same time because that'll make it really hard. They should write and then talk and switch back and forth. But actually, some of the advice that I've given isn't new at all. So there's a handout that I give people a lot from a 1986 article on how to write good multiple choice questions. It turns out that a lot of faculty haven't had need to write good multiple choice questions, so they haven't had a lot of experience doing that. So that's sort of where I come at it from. Um, so distance education has been around for a long time. There have been correspondence courses and great courses on DVDs that you could buy for hundreds of dollars. But you didn't read articles in the New York Times every week about how these great courses on DVDs were going to change the face of higher education, whereas now you do. So what was different this time? Well, for starters, there were these first three MOOCs that launched. Calling it first three MOOCs, let me go back a step. People had used the term MOOC before that. Let me use MOOC to be short for this kind of MOOC. Sometimes these are called X MOOCs. That 
got started at Stanford in October of 2011 with these three. There have been other things called MOOCs before that. They're better than it in some ways, worse than it in some ways, different from it. I'm not trying to pass judgment. I'm, I'm simply referring to the current um, wave of MOOCs as this wave that started with these three. So first of all, each of these three courses had enormous enrollments. Over 100,000 people signed up for each one. Something that was different was a critical mass of students had the bandwidth for video on demand. And because people used Facebook or maybe not MySpace anymore, but people were comfortable sharing online socially in a way that they hadn't been before. Um, the video format catered to today's attention spans. You didn't have to put on a DVD and make popcorn and spend the evening with it. The, DV the videos were short. They stopped for a check in every few minutes. Another innovation was that these classes had deadlines. So um, the term semi-synchronous often gets used to describe them. And the idea is that it wasn't that everyone had to be watching the same video at 2 PM on Tuesday. It wasn't synchronous in that sense. But it was semi-synchronous in the sense that everyone had a homework assignment due every Sunday night at midnight Pacific time or whenever the time was. So there was a cohort. Who, so that had two effects, right? One is there was a cohort who was struggling with the same material together. So maybe they could communicate on the discussion forums and so forth um, and be interested in the same thing at the same time. But also, it was motivational, right? Because sometimes no deadline means I'll do it tomorrow. Other stuff comes up. So it was a way to nudge people and keep them engaged. There was a glamour factor, frankly, to this, right? Stanford computer science is fancy, and this stuff was free. You could sign up. It was really easy to do that. I mean, another thing that's interesting is nothing new had to be invented for these classes to happen. Tools that already existed were combined with videos to make these feel just much more than a DVD set did. So MIT had offered free college level courses before in the form of open courseware. But they didn't combine them with these other tools, right? So, and the other tools were discussion, or there were a lot of other tools, but the two that I think were really important for these first three classes were discussion forums, where people could discuss the material, ask questions, um, and form a community, and auto grading, right? Auto grading has been around for a long time, but it hadn't been incorporated with materials to make a course before. And the material of these first three courses was especially amenable to auto grading. Um, one statistic, storing and serving content was now cheap. A statistic I've heard recently is that in the mid-90s, it cost $400 to store an hour of video in the, in the cloud. It now costs two cents. And so suddenly, there was a scale that made it easy <coughs> to do this. Um, so things moved quickly after those first three courses. At Stanford, a dozen more MOOCs followed closely on the heels of those. So in about, I think it was March of 2013, just about a dozen more launched. And Stanford has now been running MOOCs for two years. Another thing that is really interesting about it to me is that faculty are talking to each other in the hallways about teaching, but in a way that engages the part of their brain that used to be the research part of their brain. Um, that you know, they've been really excited about teaching. It hasn't been, oh yeah, teaching is this thing I do that doesn't really matter to my career or promotion or tenure. Suddenly people are really excited about teaching, which seems cool. Um, at Stanford, there's a new department that's providing resources and support for faculty. So I work for that department. It's called the Vice Provost for Online Learning. And Stanford has real video production now with a high-end studio. Um, no, one, and no one lets me anywhere near a camcorder anymore, which is a good thing for everyone, I think. Um, and of course, Stanford wasn't the only place where people got excited about this. So let's just look at some highlight, highlights of the landscape from where we sit now in October of 13. So the dominant, I had to change these numbers today uh, based on Coursera's announcement today of their new numbers. So Coursera is by far the dominant MOOC platform. It's got $65 million in venture funding. It now has 500 plus courses and over 5 million students. Um, Udacity, another MOOC platform, also a spinoff from Stanford, is accepting applications for an online master's in computer science from Georgia Tech, which, by the way, is a top 10 computer science department that's going to cost $6,600. So that's really potentially game changing. Um, San Jose State is using MOOCs on campus for credit. And everyone's talking about how MOOCs will or maybe won't change the state of the landscape of higher education. It's not just, it doesn't feel like something that's just, oh, this is some new fad that's going to come and go. Come and go. Universities are feeling as though they need to react to this and figure out how they're going to deal with it. Um, and suddenly, teaching can bring glory to an institution. And I guess I'm going to make the comparison with research again, that it used to be that what a professor did when he taught was internal. right? It was something sort of private. But it was between him and his students. And the thing he did 
or she did, that was external facing was research. But now suddenly teaching can be external facing and can bring glory in some of the same ways. Um, so Stanford's somewhat unusual in hosting MOOCs on multiple platforms. So I'm going to say just a little bit about that. So three MOOC startups have spun out of Stanford in the last two years. Um, Coursera, NovoEd, and Udacity. Um, don't be fooled by .org domain names. These are all for-profits. They're separate. Um, I believe that Stanford has not made any investments in any of them. Um, they're completely separate companies. Um, all of them have missions that sound very, very similar if you look up their mission statements. Our mission is to improve access to education, and they all have different bits of wording that they put around that, but very similar mission statements. Um, but some people, including at Stanford and some other places, some people have been hesitant about turning over what might be an important part of teaching to proprietary platforms. Um, I think some of this comes from concern about conflict of interest. I think some people remember what happened in the newspaper industry when value moved from content creators to content aggregators and don't want to see that happen in the education industry. Some people remember what happened in academic research journal publishing when sometimes people felt that some journal publishers ended up with too much power and were able to put <coughs> universities in a position where in order to buy the journal they wanted, they had to buy 10 journals that they didn't want and so forth. Um, and so for a range of reasons, including those and some others, um, Harvard and MIT founded edX.org um, with the idea that it would be a consortium of universities that would have a nonprofit platform that universities could use instead of one of these for-profits um, and really with a very similar set of goals. I think if you look at the mission statements, you'll find a little more in the edX.org mission statement that's about we want to learn about teaching and we want the universities to learn more about how to teach better and you find a little less of that in the other mission statements. But the main thing you find is the same as the others about improving access to education and so forth. Um, so universities pay to join the edX.org consortium and they can run courses on an edX.org branded site with revenue sharing, and there isn't much revenue now, but I think everyone presumes someday there will be, with revenue sharing that's really not worlds apart from how it works in Coursera's model. Stanford is not an edX.org consortium member. Um, what we did, we were hesitant about it. We weren't sure whether it was really going to be much better or much different from using a proprietary platform, that it was nonprofit instead of for profit, but we felt like some of the same control might be there. Um, and so edX.org had said they were planning to be open source, but at the time that we wanted to use an open source platform, they weren't open source yet. And so at Stanford, we built our own open source platform that was called Class2Go. Um, when edX did go open source, we decided to put more wood behind fewer arrows, and we've dropped Class2Go now, in our, and the same engineering team at Stanford now is working on the open edX platform. Um, so there's a team of five engineers at Stanford uh, working on the open edX platform, adapting it for Stanford's needs and so forth. On a feature level, all of the platforms are fairly similar at this point. There are some features that differ a bit from platform to platform. My expectation is that features that work well will be copied. Um, so Stanford's hosting courses on both the open source platform that came from edX and also on Coursera and NovoEd. And I'm going to summarize just a few of the pros and cons of these approaches. So uh, using a VC-funded platform is cheap because you don't have to pay for hosting charges, you don't have to pay engineers to run it, install it, keep it going, fix bugs, any of that. It's easy. Again, you don't have to do stuff to get it running, it just runs for you. They've got good stuff, right? That They've got people, kids with stock options who work hard, right? Who are building new features. They've got good stuff. Um, I think the biggest reason when I talk to Stanford faculty why a lot of them are enthused about running on Coursera in particular is audience, right? Um, I imagine that eventually there's going to be a third-party site, and there are starting to be a few. I saw today I learned about SlideRule.net is a site that aggregates MOOCs and has reviews of them. There's also Course Talk. There's also MOOC reviews. There are a few of these, but none of them is dominant yet. So right now, if you're looking for a MOOC, chances are what you're going to do is go to Coursera, and you're going to take a MOOC there. And so um, audience is a key reason for using, using for-profits, but Coursera in particular right now. And I think revenue models. My expectation is that the for-profits are going to be extremely aggressive about iterating quickly on revenue models, because everyone wants to figure out what's going to make sense financially for this. And I think that's going to be good for everyone. Um, 
On the self-hosted open source side, which Stanford is also doing, um, part of the reason is about protecting investment in content that I think some people fear that if they, an MP4 video is just an MP4 video and can be hosted elsewhere, but there's lots of other course content, content especially as things get interactive. And so I think people have some fear that even if the for-profits offer favorable business terms now for hosting courses, if you end up investing a lot in content that requires those proprietary platforms to run, you could be in trouble if they change the business terms, um, whereas that isn't the case on an open source platform. Uh, another reason is concern for owning the student relationship, right? If you're running on a for-profit platform, that platform provider is going to be messaging your students with, with it, sending them emails and so forth with their, whatever messages um, they want to deliver. Whereas on an open source platform that you host yourself, you really own that relationship. Similarly, you own the data and don't have someone else mining it. Um, you're in control of the brand. You can have the site look the way you want it to. And to the extent that there's revenue someday, it's all yours. You don't have to share it with anyone. So that's all I'm going to say about platforms. And I'm going to move on now to the relationship between faculty and students on MOOCs. So the first three MOOCs at Stanford had really great teaching um, from faculty who really cared about teaching and were good at it. And I happened to this article floated past my screen last week from, I think it was Business Insider listing the top 10 faculty at Stanford. And one of them happened to be Andrew Ng, who taught one of those first three classes. Um, and it felt to many like Stanford's crown jewels that we were opening up to the world for free, which was pretty special. Um, and despite the six-figure enrollments, students felt like they were part of a privileged circle to be taught by these really, really special faculty. The video production was oddly incommensurate with the star level of these faculty. Um, so this is typical of what you saw in these first courses. So this is Jennifer Widom's Introduction to Database course. It was filmed with a consumer-grade webcam. Um, didn't have any special background. She found a wall without a lot of books on it to be behind her, but um, it was pretty blah. Um, but it felt really authentic. In some ways, success seemed almost inversely proportional to the production values. Uh, the barrier, you know, one reason I think is that the barrier to creating a lot of content was really low. Um, when faculty doing these early courses put stuff live and then found that students were confused about something, well, sometimes they just go re-record that segment with a different way of explaining it because <coughs> it wasn't fancy and it was easy to just let's record another new version. It was shovelware is the wrong term because that has a negative connotation, but it was easy to let's just do more and get some more out the door. And um, it was a kind of an authentic feeling style. I don't have a strong sense for how long this low budget authentic feeling style is going to feel good for. And in some ways, some of these videos already look a little bit dated to me. Um, but faculty tried to make the students feel, even though there were a lot of them, as though they weren't too far away. So they used simple techniques to create intimacy. Um, you saw on the Jennifer slide before the tablet annotations. This is a slide from Sebastian Thrun's intro to AI class uh, on the platform that became Udacity at the time. It was called No Labs. And it was handwriting on paper. And sometimes the hands got in the way uh, because you know when you were writing, you couldn't see what was under it. But it successfully conveyed the feeling of working together with the faculty. Um, and students felt connected with faculty in other ways. So some of them were very active in their class forums. Um, Jennifer Widom recorded screen side chats every week. She would look through the forums or have her TA look through the forums for particular topics that people were confused about or excited about. And she would just record short one-off videos with no editing. They just did what's called top and tail, where you take off the beginning and end futzing, but do no editing in the middle. Um, and would do these videos every week just in response to what she saw on the forums, um, very off the cuff. Uh, Chuck Severance at the University of Michigan, whenever he travels, he holds office hours in Starbucks with a webcam and a microphone that he records and meets students from all over the world who take his course. And he's done this course for a number of runs now, so there are a lot of people who have met with Chuck in lots of different places. There were people during these early courses who gave up travel um, in order to participate in their forums. They just didn't want to be away from them. Um, so the videos in these early MOOCs from all of two years ago 
seem quaint compared to what's being produced now, so I'm just going to show you a few screenshots of what some of the videos coming out of Stanford look like, but some people are, some places, Duke, for instance, are actually spending way more money on this than Stanford is, so these are by far not, are by far not the fanciest MOOC videos that you'll see. Um, so this is an on-site video uh, where they were measuring the effect of G-force on people's bodies. Um, Here's a composite style, weatherman style, right, where it's filmed with a green screen and good lighting so that you can composite out the green and put the slide behind the, the person. Um, this is another composited video, and what's different about this is it has a graphic in it that was not made by the instructor. Um, that seems like a small thing, but it's actually a big thing, right, because suddenly it means you're coordinating with more people who are doing more stuff. Um, this is the evolution of that hands-on paper style that we saw a couple of slides ago. So this is a Udacity video, and it's similar to the hand-on paper style, but it's done with a tablet, and it's done composited so that the hand is under the writing, right? So it actually never blocks the way. Um, here's what some typical recording setups for Stanford faculty looked like back in 2011 and look like now. So um, this top one is my husband and he's recording by himself in his home office. Our younger son sleeps on the other side of that wall, so he had to always start after around 9.30 p.m. when the kid was sound asleep enough <coughs> that the noise wouldn't wake him, otherwise he would come in and complain. Um, the setup below is a basement at Stanford. I gather you guys actually have a TV studio here as well that's probably pretty similar to this. Um, this one at Stanford comes with a human being to operate a teleprompter and make sure everything's set up right and troubleshoot and so forth which is great, but also means that you have to make an appointment to do it. Um, whereas these recordings that were done in people's home offices, typically they did all the recording themselves and then typically either edited the video themselves or a TA would edit the video. It was typically not professional editing. Um, and it's not just that, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of complaining by the students about the low quality because it felt like this was something really special that was being given away for free. So some MOOCs have run multiple times now. Oh, yeah. What, what about the importance of actually seeing the, the lecture versus just having the screen? So I, the so I think that's a really good question. Um, and people have strong and different opinions about it. I remember I worked with Nick Parlante, who did a CS101 class. And he had his face in the corner absolutely the whole time and it was with a low quality webcam, et cetera. And he said that the reason he did it was he felt that it was important that there was someone with a smart look on his face who you could tell from his face cared about the material and that it was worth doing it that way. On the other hand, some people feel that if there's movement, you know, for instance, if you're annotating on a tablet, that it's distracting having a face with a mouth moving at the same time that you have movement on the screen and that it's better to go back and forth. As a practical matter, it's a lot harder to edit video if there's a face there because if you want to cut out two sentences, you end up with um, you know, your mouth in a slightly different place. I remember your first TA, Scott, did all those fade transitions that he thought fixed that problem. And well, I guess you got used to them after a while, but the fact is it made it hard to um, do. So I think no one really quite knows what the right balance of having a face and not having a face is. Do you have any sense of whether students prefer to see the... Formally, I don't. Informally, I can tell you that Dan McFarland in his organizational analysis class did an A-B test where he showed some students, he broke the students up into groups, some of them got his face all the time, some of them got his face some of the time, and I'm not sure what algorithm he used to choose which some of the time, but presumably something reasonable, and some of, it got his, some of them got his face none of the time. And on the forums, the students discovered this and the ones who were getting his face none of the time got really angry and upset and complained loudly enough that he gave them his face. So he kept the two groups of all of the time and some of the time, but somehow their feelings were hurt. Now, I don't know if that means that they were learning less, right? Because sometimes liking something isn't the same as learning more from it, right? So I think, you know, one thing that's fun for me about working on this stuff is there's just so much low-hanging fruit of stuff to learn, right? The answer to almost anything is I've got no idea. Um, but gee, it would be easy to learn just a few things about it. Question. Yeah? If image is not important, is voice important? Is can voice become, important? Can we completely exclude the image and voice and just provide text? Because without image, text would be better. 
That's interesting. You know, I personally hate videos. And so for me, that's an interesting question. For me, videos are always at the wrong pace. And so, so they're written in back to books. And so I like books better. But I mean, actually, I like videos for, I really like to watch TV before I go to sleep. A 40-minute TV show is just right for me to turn off my brain and have a good night's sleep. But for, and I don't have any desire to watch it at double speed or anything like that. But for learning something, I want to learn by reading. Um, but I think that for a lot of people, for, you know, I'm old, right? I think that for younger people, it's different. And I think that's a little bit like what I was saying that Nick said about someone with an intelligent look on his face caring. There's clearly stuff you get from the tone of voice and things like that, right? So I don't know. There must be studies about this, and I don't know about them. But um, the short answer is I don't know. But I suspect there's, some, there's information that's conveyed in the image and the voice. You all have you look like you've got your hand up again? No, you're just stretching. OK. Um, so reuse. I mean, part of what's exciting about reuse is, you know, in a way, I think that the scenario where MOOCs turn out to be super disruptive is a scenario where they get reused all the time, right? Not where they run once or twice or three times, but where they run 50 times or 100 times or 1,000 times, right? That's the more exciting scenario. And so thinking about MOOC reuse is interesting to me. Um, and using data from your MOOC to improve teaching was one of the ways that platform providers who were initially encouraging universities to get excited about doing MOOCs got them excited, right? That you can get all sorts of data from this to improve your teaching. Um, so if you're looking for ways to iterate on your content and make it better, a MOOC is a great way to do it, right? If you teach a MOOC and you get more students taking your course than you would otherwise have gotten in a lifetime of teaching, there's a lot. You can iterate faster, right? If it takes 10,000 students to iterate on your material, but you're dead by the time you hit 10,000, then it's harder to iterate, right? Um, so I'm a little concerned about the increasing production value. You know, on the one hand, it seems like some of the old style videos, it's not clear that you want to use them over and over again. But at the same time, the newer ones might be hard to iterate on. Yeah? Uh, um, in uh, response to your concern about the increasing production value, mm -hmm. Board hasn't been found that you know there's much better response with you know higher quality video you know necessary. Yeah. I don't think anyone has studied. I don't think anyone's done any kind of A/B test where let's do two courses that are the same except one has higher quality video and one has lower quality video. Yeah. So you know you'd think yeah you'd think it would be better, but I really don't know. Um, I mean it could be that people will find it off-putting. And you know the, the getting past one minute barrier, right? Once there are a lot of choices and people are choosing between courses and they watch the first minute of two courses that seem similar, that might not be enough time to judge which is really going to have more thoughtful exercises. Um, but it might be enough time to judge which has nicer videos, right? So it's hard to say, right? There's this good feeling. So I've gotten into TV lately. I've got this theory that watching it late at night is good. And when, uh, and when House of Cards came out, Right on Netflix, I had been watching. I've only recently gotten into TV, so I didn't watch West Wing when it came out. So I was in the middle of watching West Wing when House of Cards came out, and I switched for a little while from West Wing to House of Cards. And that intro sequence in House of Cards that's really fancy and flashy, like that first time I watched House of Cards, I was like, wow, this is going to be great. I'm so glad this came out, right? In fact, I think actually the characters on House of Cards weren't quite as fun as on West Wing. And West Wing is better, really. But it took a while to figure that out, right? That the cool video production on House of Cards is just flashy and nice, and that's got to be attractive to do. Yeah? Uh, speaking of high quality video, will it affect the cost of production and in turn the cost of teaching the course? If you're assuming at this point that your quality is <coughs> I mean, I think that low quality videos are cheaper to produce than high quality videos, right? And but I think some people feel that if eventually these courses are going to produce revenue, there's going to be enough revenue that the cost of video production is going to pale in comparison to the revenue. And to some extent, the most expensive part of the cost is faculty time. And a lot of these early MOOCs were done with faculty who were doing it in their own time unpaid, right? Um, and so there wasn't literally the cost of faculty time. That was sort of a hidden cost. But that cost is there. And so I think certainly at a university, Faculty time is seen as more valuable than paying some video editor who would be inexpensive. Right? Yeah? Uh, 
there's another aspect to uh, production quality like uh, i have done a couple of mooc courses uh, and i'm from india we don't have as good speeds as uh, we find in us so uh, having a smooth flowing video even if it is not good quality mm. is still better than having a good quality video and not really smooth right yeah absolutely and i think it's nice if platform providers can provide multiple versions right certainly a lot of people in countries like india and so forth will download videos overnight rather than watching them streaming and it's nice to make that magic painful. Okay, let me go on. I want to try to get through. I don't I'm not committed to getting through all of my slides, but let me try and get through a few more. Um, so, differing levels of involvement are okay, right? It's not that I think that you're a bad professor if you don't spend all day on your discussion forum on your MOOC. Um, but I think students should probably know what to expect. Right now students don't have any way of being able to tell before a class starts whether this is one where the instructor is involved or one where they're not. If you look at the Coursera contract with the University of Michigan, which because it's a public university is public, um, it's clear that Coursera's expectation is that the only involvement is going to be in the first run. And so Coursera asks the university to try to get there to be involvement from the faculty or TA in the first run, but not at all after that. Um, but I think the main thing here is managing student expectations. Because if students join a course expecting to be able to interact with the faculty on the forum, but then can't, they're sometimes upset. So here are just a few quotes, and I won't actually read them out loud, but these are students who were unhappy because they didn't get the kind of instructor involvement that they expected, and they were disappointed not to get it. Which surprises a lot of people, because I think many providers' assumption is free, anything is better than Yeah, anything. right. So, so why would people be upset? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's about managing expectations, as in so many things. Right. So I've so, yeah. Uh, so how many teaching assistants do you expect to have? Uh, let's say ten thousand students. That's a good question. I think it depends a lot on how much money you have, and on how much you care, and it also depends on how how well worked out the course material is, right? So if you've got, let's say, a bunch of auto-graded material <coughs> that's non-trivial, right? It's not just multiple choice questions, it's something more complex than that. Chances are it's not gonna work right the first time. And so I think in the first run of your course, you're gonna want a lot of them. Um, similarly, like I know when Scott Clemmer does peer evaluation, he likes to have TAs do ground truth evaluations of a whole bunch of assignments that then get sprinkled in with what people peer assess. And well, you need a bunch of TAs if you're gonna do that. If you want to be involved in the forum, one way to be involved in the forum is to have TAs pre-screen the forum and email the professor each day one thing of here's something you might want to reply to. Or even just here's an issue that students are confused about, right? So the short answer is more in the first run and fewer in later runs, and it depends a lot on the content. Um, so I think this quote was about a class <coughs> where they were saying that basically uh, that top quote, there was no involvement whatsoever in the forums. No one was looking at it. And you can do that, right? But it's not the only way. So I think there's a broad range. So were you able to successfully, I mean, I, I can't manage my students' expectations. They always want the answer from the school. Well, besides, I had all the old tests and everything else. I can really tell them. I'm not giving them the old uh -huh. exam answers. So, they still are very mad about it. But so I think the right thing to do is to have a standard, you know, in course descriptions right now, there are some standard fields you include, like how many hours of work do you expect the students to do, and what prerequisites do you expect, and do you have to, are there any other materials outside the course you need? I think what's the involvement level of the instructor should be one of those standard fields, and that you should just publish that. That the problem is it isn't. So there's no way to tell if you're picking between two courses if one is going to have the instructor involved and one isn't, and there should just be a way to tell, and that should be standard. And that may be a place where there's some conflict of interest with the providers um, versus the student. I'm not sure. But I think there should just be a standard field. So I've talked a little bit about instructor use of discussion forums, but I haven't really talked about student use of them yet. So discussion forums, I think, hold a special place in my heart, possibly because, for historical reasons, because they were one of my first hobbies when I was in High school in the early 80s, I was one of these geeky kids who got a 300 baud modem and I ran a BBS from my bedroom in high school. Um, and luckily, discussion forums have evolved since then, but they haven't evolved quite as much as you might have hoped. 
And that's not why discussion forums are, are interesting. Um, I think why discussion forums are interesting in the context of MOOCs is that there are so many ways that a MOOC is less good and is always going to be less good than an in-person class that what's cool, I think, is to think about the ways where a MOOC can be better than an in-person class. And I, that something that can use the size of it to its advantage, to have that be an advantage, not a disadvantage. And I think discussion forums can be like that. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about what other things might be like this. And I'm not going to talk about any of these other things. But I don't think discussion forums are the only things like this. So I think peer evaluation can be like that. Course wikis, contests, group work, <coughs> gamification. Those are all things that exist today. But in the future, I guess I think group annotation systems might be like that. There were a couple of students who I talked with today who were working on something like that that sounded interesting. I think real-time chat is going to be like that. Um, but of the things that we have today, discussion forums are a prominent one of things that can make a MOOC better in some ways than an on-campus class. So I was curious about how MOOC users use these discussion forums. Um, uh, so they're often mentioned, including by me, as one of the reasons that MOOCs have taken off. Um, and I've heard them used as a reason to offer these courses in semi-synchronous mode, right? I mentioned two reasons, deadlines to be a nudge, but also discussion forums that it gives you a cohort on the discussion forums. But what if most people use discussion forums only in read-only mode? Um, and I think other open, there are other open questions like, should forums start empty with each course run? Now that courses are running over and over, we're reflexively treating each run as though it were the first. And maybe we don't need to, right? Maybe there are standard questions that lots of people ask that, could, that don't need to be asked anew each time, and we should be starting um, with full discussion forums at the start. I'm not sure. Or maybe they naturally group into two types of questions. I don't really know. So something Stanford has that's super cool is data from the MOOCs we've run so far. So I thought I would dig a little, dig around in that a little bit and see what I could find about discussion forum use. Um, so together with some partners in crime, I took a look at data from 32 courses that Stanford ran. Um, and I used all Coursera courses simply because that's, first of all, it meant it was easier from a data perspective because all the data looked the same. And it meant that you were comparing apples with apples to some extent. So these courses had just over 1.3 million enrollments. Um, that was about 840,000 people of those 1.3 million enrollments. So most people enrolled on average in a little bit under two classes. Actually, that number was surprising to me because I enroll in dozens of MOOCs. I'm the cause of the low completion statistics. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that not everyone does that. Um, so on average, we found that 4.3% of students posted on forums. 2.5% posted more than once. A lot of classes have on forums, introduction threads where people introduce themselves, or thank you threads where you thank the professor. And so it seems like looking at more than once has some meaning. 0.8% um, posted more than five times on a forum. Um, but I think this undercounts, because the fact is that's using this famous denominator that people use when they talk about low completion rates in MOOCs, which is excuse me, people who submitted an email address to register for the class. But there's a low barrier to entry for doing that. So instead, I decided to look at the data broken down by grade decile. So let me, um, let me piece this apart a little bit. So what this chart shows is students grouped into buckets based on the decile of their grade rounded down. So I took their grade, I divided it by 10, and I rounded down to the nearest integer. So if you got between 0 and 9.9% .9 in the course, you were in the 0 grade decile. So that's all those people who never logged on. And also people who logged on maybe did one quiz, but then never came back. Um, anyone, so if you got an 87% of students fall into that bucket. And so really, the students that I'm more interested in are the 13% who don't fall into that bucket. Um, and so I used shades of green to show how much people posted. So the light green are people who posted once. The middle green are people who posted between two and five times. And the dark green are greater than five posts. And I experimented with doing it in the other order because it seems counterintuitive this way. But I wanted to be able to see easily how many people did the highest number of posts and then going down lower. So one thing you can see is that in order to start to see 10% of students posting five or more times, you have to get all the way up to the students scoring 90% or more level, which really surprised me because people talk about these 
great communities on the forums. I guess I expected to find that if not most students participating, I expected to find most students who pass the course participating. But really that wasn't the case, right? That if you take people who pass the course, you know, these ones who got 60, even among students who got a 60, that what you find is that about 5%, a little more than that, post more than five times, about another 10% post two to five times, and another 10% post once, but 75% of them never post at all, right? Yeah? Are uh, any of these postings anonymous? Oh, on Coursera, you can post anonymously. It's not anonymous to the instructor, but it's anonymous to the other students, and I did not calculate how many were, but that'd be easy to calculate. On the Yata, you can actually control, the student can control all their posts. It can be completely anonymous huh. for the instructor, uh -huh. or known to the instructor, or known to everybody. And right. It makes a big difference. Right, and do you like that feature? Um, I don't like the completely anonymous. But uh, I think that the, the... You can control that on Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I know. Um, but, but I know that, that, that uh, if I block students from posting anonymous, much less posts. So, huh. You know, it's, it's a balance. Even yeah. anonymous to each, like it's not enough for them to be able to post anonymously to each other. They want to be able to be anonymous to you too? That, that's where I'm, <coughs> I'm hedging. I, I'm not right. sure. But, but definitely, huh. if, if, if they can't post anonymously to each other, then they don't post. That's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, so well, I think you these see are. If you post in the anonymous category of the form, the emperor has no clothes. Right. Which when they're earnest can be extremely useful. Right. And then you see a few that are just plain bait. Right. Uh, trolling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are they only posting when they have problems, or is there sort of more communication? I think there's more communication. Um, I'm trying to think of what the incentive is to post and to reply to posts. And I'm trying to think of stuff like Reddit uh -huh. or some of those communities where right. people post for you know, things like Karma Point. Absolutely. So I think that sort of I think all that stuff should come to MOOC forums too. Yeah. Well, this is the same thing as the same three kids who always raise their hands. Yeah, maybe. Asking us the questions. They're the ones who are already asking the question about. So that's right, but I think that the 97 kids who aren't raising their hands in class are very aware of the finite amount of time in the classroom and aren't <coughs> raising their hands, not because they don't have anything to say, but partly because they don't want to take up everyone's time. They feel like it's selfish to be one of those three kids. But to some extent, it's zero sum on a MOOC forum. It still takes up space, but the ratio is much different, right? That there's, it's much more elastic, the amount that can be tolerated. Um, yeah. Do you see negative correlation between the quality of the course and the amount of discussions on the forum? Good question. That's a really good question. And I'm going to go on to my next couple of slides because it doesn't directly address it, but I think it's related to it. So some classes have more active forums than others. So I'm not expecting you to read that small print on the left. What you're supposed to see here is simply that there's a broad range of, and what I'm measuring here is, for those 87% of students who score 10% or more, how many of them post more than once, right? So what percentage of these engaged students are posters? Um, and the median is about 17%, but you can see it goes from under 10% to close to 30%, so there's a broad range. So I want to, so I've got another version of this slide that has colors. I wanted to do fancy animation, but I was too lazy. Um, but this is the same slide as the previous one, but what it's got is colors that, um, show multiple runs of the same course. And so you can see there's a bit of clustering, right? So that yellow course is a super hard, highly technical course. It's one where the instructor didn't post at all, and it seemed to have a lot of um, forum activity. But the light blue course is at the very top and near the bottom. Um, the red ones are courses that ran just once. But and you, So you can see there's some clustering, but it's not um, a lot. So I think that there are some interesting questions about why certain courses have more posting than others. I mean, another interesting thing that comes up is that there's this phenomenon that we called super posters, which is there are some students who seem to take it upon themselves to answer everyone's question and really be there all the time in the forum. So I wanted to have a look at those. And I did the same thing where I, so I defined a super poster with a kind of a rough and ready definition of posted more than 50 times. I think that's a bad definition, right? Because someone who posted 50 times in a six-week course posted a lot more than someone who posted 50 times in a 10-week course. 
you could get more subtle. But this was easy to calculate. So this is what we did for now. And I did the same thing of the different colors. Um, and I wondered if the same courses on multiple runs would tend to have the same amount of super posters. Um, but they didn't. There was really a lot of variation. Um, if you're curious, we had 662 super posters in our data set, which were composed of 620 distinct users. Um, there were 55,900 people posting, so just over 1% were super posters by this definition. Um, Average grades for super posters tended to be high. They varied by course. On the low end, it was 74% as the average grade. On the high end, 100%. Um, and we ran a few correlations to see if anything jumped out at us. Like I, what I really expected to find was that classes with low instructor posting activity or low TA posting activity were going to get a lot of super posters, that they were going to be jumping in to fill the void that instructors were leaving as the voice of authority. Um, but actually, that was not the case at all. There was a less than 0.1 correlation with um, instructor and TA posting and percent of super posters. There was a high correlation with what percentage of posts are accounted for by super posters and what percentage of engaged students post. Um, I was surprised by that. I kind of thought that maybe super posters would make it seem like a click that you had to already be in to join and would be off-putting to other people, but that wasn't it at all. And I don't have any sense for which direction the causality goes in, right? It could be that super posters make the forum feel welcoming and make people feel able to post, or it could be that super posters see that a lot of people are asking questions that need to be answered and they feel like they need to jump in and help because they see stuff going on. Um, so that was interesting. Other arbitrary facts about super posters, the ratio of responses to first posts in thread posted by super posters was 10 to 1 versus 6 to 1 for non-super posters, which is to say super posters were not normally starting new threads. They were normally responding to threads that were already started. And someone who's a super poster in one class is three times as likely to be a super poster in another class that they're enrolled in as someone who isn't. Um, uh, and I also have slides on viewing data, but what I suspect I should maybe do is just flash them by you and skip to the conclusion so that we have a little time for discussion. And if someone's desperate to ask about the viewing data, I can show these slides. So I'll just flash those by you. Um, the so the unengaged people, they're out really fast. Yeah. That's what that's like. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, here we go, little highlights from that. Just flashing by. Um, so students complain bitterly about forums. They've got a lot of repetitive threads. There's poor sorting. It's hard or impossible to view by author or subject. There's poor searching and tagging. There's no display of related questions. And I presume that the vehemence with which students complain about this is this feeling that there's just so much missed opportunity. Um, and MOOCs are far from the first place to use forums, as someone over there mentioned a few minutes ago. This is an area with plenty of prior art, right? If you Google Reddit ranking algorithm, you find all sorts of interesting blog posts of how Reddit has changed their ranking algorithm over the years, how it differs for comments, then for new threads, and so forth. Um, there are all sorts of questions, right? Um, should early votes up or down on a post count more than later votes up or down? Should reputation be required to vote a post down? Who should be able to create tags? Um, and I think with respect to MOOC, Forums, it's unclear. Are short-lived per-course communities even the right model? Um, some courses are forming communities outside of the course that can live over multiple runs of the course. What's the right path there? Something I think is really cool is that Stack Exchange, despite being a for-profit proprietary platform, does not keep their data in a walled garden, and they have a fabulous um, web-based interface to query the data. So I've only, I haven't really spent any time on this, but in five minutes I was able to query how many of posts on Stack Overflow were posted by people who had posted more than 49 times versus fewer than 50 times? And the answer is almost twice as many. So, and that makes sense on longer lived communities like that, that most of the posts come from super posters. Probably there's a different definition of super posters needed there. But at any rate, there's a ton we can learn from existing online communities, and we should do so. Here's another quote that I won't read out loud. Um, the point is forum software is bad, but forums are really important. And I think that this applies a fortiori to MOOC forums right now. 
And so in closing, I'm going to just list some open questions that I think make a difference in MOOCs. So what's the most scalable way to create a feeling of relationship with the teacher? What production styles for videos will work for the long term? What are the right media, for instance, the balance between things to read and videos? How can we improve discussion forums? What are other ways to leverage the size of a class and turn it into an advantage? What advantages do semi-synchronous versus evergreen courses have? And then my favorite from my Netflix obsession, which is um, in other areas, we're starting to see content released all at once, like House of Cards on Netflix, which doesn't seem to hurt the cohort at the water cooler at all. And so maybe we could be doing the same with MOOC courses. Maybe they could be evergreen and be successful. Unclear. Thank you for listening. Questions? Yeah. Um, this gets to like the passive versus active user. So one mm -hmm. of the features I find really useful on Coursera is that you can search the discussion forums for certain topics, and sometimes yeah. it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But I wondered if you studied how people do that. Because to me, that's not a passive use. That's actually active. You have specific questions. Rather than just posting, you actually look to see what other people have said on that. Right? Yeah, that's so, cool. So I haven't done that. So oh, okay. we have these log files from Coursera. And all I did was I wrote a, I, what did I do? I wrote a Python script that looked for view thread, question mark, thread ID equals, to get people who viewed threads. But you could easily look for how many searches people tend to do. That would be, I think, really yeah, interesting. Yeah, and there would probably be themes of questions, so then the instructor would be able to see what people were looking up and whether or not they were finding their answers yeah. in the forum. So yeah, I think that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that feels like low-hanging fruit. And again, I think that you might find that people do multiple searches because the search engines powering the forums now aren't very useful. If you look at a discussion, if you look at a post on Stack Overflow, you immediately see related questions mm. show up, right? That it's done a search for you while you're already looking at something. I'd like to see stuff like that happen on MOOC forums. Yeah? Because we are now many advanced work for posting many videos. Mm -hmm. What are the most advanced online work? Oh, I don't know. Name a few, and I can tell you. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm Platforms for posting right. text. Because uh, the course is uh -huh. not only video. And That's you right. You don't care about it. uh, right. It's also about posting text. And yeah. text may be very advanced. It can be interspersed with questions, challenges, and whatever. So what he, To some extent, I feel like the most effective text I've seen on MOOCs are when instructors just use HTML that can have JavaScript in it for where you can try things, right? While you read text, that can work well. But I don't have the sense that there's a platform for posting text in the same way that there's YouTube for posting videos. But, but I think that's an interesting question. Course, many courses include professor working class sure. and recommending a textbook. Yeah. So where is the place on MOOC for a textbook? Oh, well, so that, I mean, that brings up the whole question of DRM, right? So I think right now there are these readers that respect digital rights management agreements with publishers. And I don't know much about them, and I imagine some of them are more usable than others. And probably they're all a little bit frustrating because the goal of them is to prevent you from being able to repurpose and steal that content, right? Um, and I don't know which one has the best balance of respecting DRM and still being usable for the students. How many professors at MOOCs are essentially narrating some books? How, how, to what extent it's happening? I, pro I think it happens a lot. And there are certainly good MOOCs and bad MOOCs, right? I, I think so MOOCs that are a narration of a textbook are not as good as a MOOC that's something different, right? That you can use it for lots of different things. Not as much as I'd like to see. Um, so, you know, videos are videos and can be used anywhere, but I'm not seeing a lot of recombining. One issue is that Coursera's terms of service don't permit you to use MOOC material in a four credit course. And so, actually, that's one of the things that has driven Stanford towards using open source platforms. So, for instance, San Jose State is running Jennifer Widom's database course now 
but there, we haven't ported that course over to Open edX yet, so they're running it on class to go But the reason they're using class to go is they don't have to violate Coursera's terms of service, and we simply set up an extra course instance for them so that they could keep track of their students' grades, and they could change the deadlines and release dates for material and make their own announcements, right? I think one nice thing about an open source platform is that it lets you copy courses and reuse them. But you know what we're not doing for them is saying, okay, you're using version 2.3 of Jennifer Widom's database course, but actually problem seven in that class has changed, and do you want the update, right? That, and I guess I think there's gotta be a future model, and I've sort of got GitHub in my head, right? That where it's more like that, and that people could propose changes and submit a pull request with their changes, and that- I actually found bits and pieces of edX courses on GitHub. Uh-huh. Parts of this already exist, but it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like the platforms are in. Right. I, I hope that two years from now, when we have this conversation, that's happening all the time everywhere, and there are clear ways to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, to some degree, it seems that these courses are benefiting um, so from the super clusters and kind of the community that's built around them or that attracted them to that course in general. I was wondering, um, has there been any uh, kind of research done or just any thinking around extending the, the runtime of these courses and maybe seeing if a more long-term community might emerge and through some of the learning that goes on? So I think that's a great idea. So one thing that Scott did was he made a LinkedIn group for people who graduated from his HCI course. And um, he let me subscribe to the group even though I didn't actually take the course. Um, and what I see on that course is people asking each other questions about what tools are they using, and gee, what do they think of this other course that just came out? And so it's an ongoing community. Um, and there are a few people who have done things like that. But it'd be interesting to see maybe really the platforms should be more structured around that rather than structured around individual semi-synchronous runs, right? I, I think that's an interesting question. Yeah. So I was surprised that you seemed bummed out that the forum participation rate looked low. Huh. And if I look at things like Wikipedia or on campus here, I love walking along the main drag at lunch hour right. with people handing out flyers. Uh -huh. and you but you don't stand there and do it. Well, yeah. but to, to mm -hmm. make a campus vibrant, mm -hmm. you need somebody to yeah, chat yeah. and yell and protest and uh -huh. hand out flyers. If nobody does it, right. you don't have a community. Uh -huh. But you don't need 100% of the people to hand out flyers. You only need some. Uh huh. So that's a really good point. And maybe the right answer is, well, maybe I'm not bummed. Maybe I, so I am a little bit bummed. And I'm a little bit bummed because it feels like I want to know what the numbers would be if the, if the tools were better, right? Because I think that you know, those 97 people who aren't raising their hands in class, some of them probably do have questions or things to contribute. And so I'm a little bummed in that respect. But I also am more bummed that people are referring to forums as a reason to keep offering MOOCs only in this semi-synchronous mode with potentially artificial start and end times for the reason that, oh, well, there's this great community on the discussion forum, and that's why we have to do it that way. And so I mostly want to be saying, wait, wait, maybe we don't have to be doing it that way. Maybe if most people just take the flyer, actually it's fine if we make the material available all the time. We had an interesting experience recently where we put a Twitter feed on the home page, mm -hmm. and it increased the number of tweets by an order of magnitude. We overnight. saw the same thing on class to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's cool. So maybe you could put a discussion forum feed on the home page. Yeah, that'd I mean, be cool. I, 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 mean, I, do, I do think that the home page design is underutilized. Really, there's a lot that could be yeah, thought yeah. about. That's a really good point. More mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Some of your, your interactive mm -hmm. chat ideas have that right. model too. Uh -huh. Something like a news feed, you know, yeah, I think that'd be cool. Yeah? Uh, so now there are almost all courses are different, but there is now already competition between courses yep. with the same name. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's immediately clear that one of these courses will win. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think there will be a lot of, of like, how many courses do we expect on calculus? A topic with this very stable content when mainly the main value is the production value and 
kind of how to work. Well, I don't think the main value would be the production value. I think the main value would be the pedagogical value. But you yeah, would hope that the one actor, that's dominant. How good is the actor presenting the course? How mm -hmm. good is the artist, essentially professor, right. presenting it? It's uh -huh. not the content because the content is very, very stable. There are very few new tricks somebody can invent. Right. So what what do you think about this competition? There are these statistics that something like some huge percentage, and I wish I had the number off the top of my head, but some huge percentage of unit hours throughout the US are from exactly 30 classes. Does anyone know the percentage? But it's some huge number. Is it 35 percent? I'm not sure, but it's some surprising number. And you've just got to think that in those areas, there's going to be a dominant calculus class, just like there's a dominant Econ 1 textbook there's going to be a dominant Econ 1 or intro calculus class that everyone is going to use. And I think places like Stanford are going to get over their currently snobbish feeling that we can produce content that others can use, but they don't really talk about using others as content. Already, Harvard Business School doesn't teach intro to accounting and uses BYU's content for that. I think there's going to be a range of stuff, and intro to calculus is probably one of them, where there's going to be one dominant great version that's going to have high production values, good pedagogical values be iterated on and improved, have exercises that really work and that everyone will use. And that's probably a great note. Okay. To end on. Thank Thanks you. a lot.